All right, thank you, sir. Well, good morning. Yeah. Listen, I just drove 140 miles, and I don't expect that that cuts it. So let's do this again. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, goodness gracious. Thank you. Gold star right there. Well, uh, you know, it, it's been since last year since I've seen you, and all, you all look a lot older, uh, that's for sure. Uh, I, you know, how many had a great Christmas? All right, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you I can top your Christmases. We had six Christmases, all right? Uh, and uh, so we were on the road a lot. We took uh, the, the Christmas road show, and we did that uh, in between since I've seen you the last time. Uh, my daughter, my granddaughter move, is going to be moving to Orlando, so a couple of weekends ago, I don't know what day it is, but I flew out to Oklahoma City, and she and I drove from Oklahoma City to Orlando, Florida in less than two days, and then we uh, flew back to Richmond, then we had Christmas, and two weeks from today, I'll be on my way to the, the you can really feel bad for me, I'm going to the Azores, the islands off of Portugal, isn't that sad? Uh, I know you'll feel sad for me, but anyway, but it's good to be back with you, and uh, as, as Aaron mentioned, you know, when you come from the Northeast, you're used to driving in bad weather, and, uh, <laughs> but I got to tell you, you know, I mean, all of Lynchburg, I don't know how it was up here, but they were all, they, I mean, when the weather gets bad, it seems like they're, the people have a desire for French toast because all the milk, eggs, and bread are gone from the store. Did you ever notice that, right? And everything disappears. And uh, everybody was all psyched up, and we got cold rain yesterday. It looks like you guys had a little bit more bad weather, but I'm glad to be able to be with you. So it is a new year, and as I thought about what I wanted to share with you this morning uh, and so forth, uh, I, I wanted to kind of kick off the, the year, and I, I want to do it with a couple of questions. Number one, how many of you are hoping and praying for a good year in 2024? Anybody here? The rest of you are either asleep, liars, or you really are pathetic. Which is it, all right? Uh, all right, now, how many of you, since we are in the seventh day of 2024, how many of you have already had something that's been not good happen? Anybody? You know, this, wait, Aaron, I don't know. This crowd is bad today. All right. Uh, well, I don't know about you, but, 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 but because maybe it's just the sheer family size that we have, we have problems in our life sometimes. And, and, and I think human nature being what it is, sometimes we think that, you know, for, for, our, for having to have a good year or to have a good life or even a good day, that means we can't have any problems. But, but here's the reality, folks. If you're alive, you're going to have problems. I mean, life is filled with problems. So, so how can we juxtapose the idea of having a good life, a good year, a good day, with this concept of life is filled with problems? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning. I want to talk to you about some steps for a good year, a good life, uh, whatever, however you want to do it. And it's interesting because I do not communicate with anybody up here as to you know what the song structure is going to be or what i barely even get time to share what i'm going to be preaching on so there's no coordination and you might say well that's pretty bad but actually it's amazing to me how god orchestrates what he puts in my heart and what y'all have already sung because we've already sung a lot about the goodness of god did you see that i don't know if you saw that pattern and that ties into what i want to look at this morning in james chapter one turn to james chapter one this morning and I'm going to give you three steps to a good life, a good year, good whatever, in spite of whatever else is going on in your life. Now, while you're turning there, let me give you a little background to the book of James. A couple of things. Some people call James the Proverbs of the New Testament. And they call it that because there's a lot of practical information in the book of James. And, and I think that's good. It talks about the tongue. I don't know about you, but I'm a person that I, I, need, I need all the instruction on the tongue I can get. I'm kind of like Peter, all right? Open mouth, insert foot. Anybody else like that? All right? I, you know, so, I, so I, anything about the tongue, I, I'm good with that. And he talks about, you know, how we should treat people and so forth. He talks about teachers. So it's a very practical book, even though it's not listed in Proverbs like, or, or like, you know, little sayings like the book of Proverbs is. Nevertheless, 
The book is chock filled with wisdom. Number two, the book of James is authored by, are you ready this? James, all right? And James, though, was the brother or technically the half-brother of Jesus. You all know that Jesus uh, was the firstborn of Mary and Joseph. Of course, Joseph wasn't his biological father, but he was his adopted father. But Mary and Joseph had a couple kids after that, and James was one of them. And interestingly enough, none of Jesus' siblings really bought into the fact that he was the Messiah and Savior until after the resurrection. And again, I, I don't know if I shared this with you or not, but, but uh, I, I got to tell you, to be a sibling of Jesus had to be tough. I mean, it had to be tough. I, I, don't, know, I don't know about you, but, but you know, I have a younger brother. He, that was another thing that happened during the break. He came down to visit us. He's from Philly. And he said, you know, you, you know it wasn't always easy growing up in the light of you, Fred, you know. And, of course, that's what everybody says. Anyway, um, my humility is what's the best part of me. Anyway, uh, you know, he said, you know, why aren't you more like your big brother? Well, imagine being Jesus' siblings. His mom and dad saying, why can't you be more like Jesus and pick up your room? Why can't you be more like Jesus and do good work at school? I mean, think about what it was like to be a sibling of Jesus. And James was one of those. And so he did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah until after the resurrection. So that's an important piece of information. James also was one of the first martyrs of the early church. He was the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, and he was martyred early on uh, for his faith. And so he writes this little epistle here, and you know what an epistle is. It's not a baby apostle. An epistle is a letter, all right? And, uh, you know, it's the new year. I got, all, I got all of them to unload on you today, all right? Anyway, uh, and so he, he is going to write to people, and he tells us who he writes to, James chapter 1, verse 1, a bondservant, of the Lord uh, and of God and the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Let me stop there just for a second. James is writing to Jewish Christians. He's writing to people who were born Jewish but who had converted to Christianity. Now, if you think you have problems, you have no idea what it was like to be a Jewish Christian. I mean, they had problems. They were often rejected by their family. They were outcasts of their, of their community. I mean, it was not an easy life for them. And so that's who he's writing to, and it's important that you know that because when you read through this book, you've got to keep in mind who the author is and who he's writing to and why he's writing. Because that provides the context, and it gives us insight into what the author is saying. So now we'll get down to where I want to look at. To the twelve tribes which are abroad, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind three steps if you will three elements three components three whatever you want to call them that i see in this text here this morning that i think give us a, a recipe for having a good 2024 in spite of what happens a good life overall and i'm going to give them to you then we'll we'll ask god to guide us today as we open up his word and then i'll unpack this together number one to have a good year or a good life, you need a good approach. And specifically, you need to take a good approach. Number two, to have a good year, a good life, not only do you need to take a good approach, but you need to make good asks, A-S-K-S, -S, or questions. But for alliteration purposes, I'm going to use the word A, all right? So we have to have a good approach, good asks, and finally... We have to seek good outcomes or a good aftermath. Good approach, good asks, and a good aftermath. Lord, we thank you for a new year. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for safety. Thank you for warmth in the building. Thank you for protection. Thank you for the season we just came through. Lord, thank you. For your goodness as we've sang about already this morning 
Lord, thank you for your word. And now as we open it up, I pray that you would remove the distractions from our minds and our hearts so that we can focus on not what I say, Lord, but what you are saying in your word. May your Holy Spirit guide me and use me to accomplish that which you have called forth your word to do. Should there be someone here that doesn't know you as their personal Savior, I pray you would just open up their minds and hearts to the, the goodness of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And for all of us who already know you and claim to be your children, Lord, may we leave here today determined that no matter what, we will live a good life for your glory. Pray. Amen. So, first off, we need to take a good approach. I already give you the, the, the context of this. And notice what it says in verse, uh, in verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy. We'll come back to that, in a, in the, uh, that phrase in a minute. When? Now, I, I don't know, you know, I'm sure you've heard lots of preachers over the years. I'm a person that likes to pay attention to the words in a text. I think they're there for a reason. And the word when there is an interesting word to me. Because he says, when you fall into various trials. Because I think sometimes we as Christians live our life not as if it would be when we fall into trouble in our life, but if we fall into trouble. In other words, there, are, there seems to be a mindset that is prevalent among many Christians where we seem to think that, well, if I get saved... If I ask Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, and I ask him to come into my heart, and I repent of my sins, if I do that, then, bada bing, bada boom, God's going to make my life great. I mean, God's going to give me the desires of my heart. God's going to, to, to bestow on me, you know, I, 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 I've always enjoyed the Gaither's music, but there's a couple songs that theologically I have some, uh, you know, uh, some questions with him. One that comes to my mind where he says, you know, if, it keep, if he keeps on blessing and blessing, and if he keeps on pouring it on, if my cup gets fuller and fuller, and if he keeps on giving me a song, and, and all that's great. And believe me, I like fun. I like ease. I like comfort. I like convenience. I mean, look at me, all right? I like good stuff. But, but James is pointing out that that when we become a Christian, it's a not, not a matter of if we have troubles, it's merely a matter of when. And if you've truly lived seven days in this new year and you haven't had any bad thing, God love you, that ain't my life. That's not my life. I got 31 other people in my family. There's always something going on. I mean, just this past Friday, my daughter and my wife and my son-in-law and my whole family, and, and I should show you the text messages. I mean, it's nuts, all right? But my grandson, Apollo, was born two years ago, coming up on, on the 25th of this month. He was born uh, uh, with a severe um, uh, meconium syndrome, if you know what that is, a bad, almost didn't make it, and two years later found out that at two, he had significant hearing loss. And so all building up to this past Friday, there's been this whole drama because he, it's kind of scary to have a two-year-old have to go in under complete anesthesia. And he was under for, and, they, and the poor little kid, all right, I'm going to digress here, but this is on my mind right now, all right? The poor little kid, he's not even two, wasn't allowed to eat or drink anything from midnight the night before. Imagine that. And he didn't go into surgery till like 4 o'clock the next afternoon. So there is a lot of stress in the Malaysia family going on. And that's just one little event. Now, I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you, wake up and smell the coffee here, folks. It's not a matter of if you're going to have troubles, it's when. I mean, right now as a church, you may not... You know, I know the church is doing well and so forth, but let's face it, being in transition is not exactly, you know, happy camper times. There is some trials with that. So I think it's interesting, and I think it's a good way to have a good life and a good year is to just kind of begin to internalize, and not in the sense of being, a, you know, a negative Nelly or a De Debbie Downer or anything like that, but, but to, to recognize that if you are alive, there is going to be problems. And just because you're a Christian 
Just because you love God, just because you come to church, even on snowy days when everybody else is canceled, I'm aware of that, all right? And and in spite of the fact that you may tithe, and in spite of the fact that you may serve, and and in spite of the fact that you may read your Bible and pray every day, folks, it doesn't matter what you do because this is a sin-cursed world. You will have problems. And you can take one of two routes to that. You can be like some people do, and you can, uh, you know, decide that, well, if, that's the, if, if a loving God's going to allow that kind of thing into my life, then I want nothing to do with that, and there are many people that respond that way. Or you can say, you know, this is part of life, and it's not a matter of if, but it's when, so I need to figure out how I'm going to deal with these things, so that no, no matter what happens, I'm still going to have a good life that brings glory to God. So that's what James reminds us. He says, my brethren, when you, and the next word's interesting, fall. That's an interesting word too, fall. Think about falling for a minute. As I get older, I think about it a lot more. Anybody else? (laughs) I love these ladies. The rest of you, I don't care about them. They're with me. Falling. Why don't I like snow? I don't like to fall. Don't like to fall. This makes me a little nervous here, all right? I have almost fallen. Do you, Sam, do you walk around much, or do you pretty much stay put? Uh, yeah, yeah. Good thing you're not Italian. Anyway, plus I got to get my steps in. I tell you that every week. Anyway, I walk a lot, and sometimes I get close to falling. But think about falling for a minute. How can you fall? Well, you can trip. All right? So you can trip into problems. Did you ever trip into a problem? I have. Have you ever been pushed into a problem? Oh, yeah. And then there's also times, you know, uh, (laughs) sometimes we fall because somebody, or excuse me, we fall out of our own stupidity. My wife, you know, there used to be this thing years ago. It was called Dumb Ways to Die, all right? And I don't know if you remember that, Dumb Ways to Die. And honestly, I, I, I think about that. Like, if I'm getting on a ladder or doing anything like that, it's, she's always like, I, I'm sure she cares about me. She's like, I really would hate to tell everybody that you, supposedly the smart guy, died in this really dumb way, all right? And think about some of the trials you've had in your life. Sometimes you just tripped into them. They were accidental. Sometimes there are other people that kind of eased you into the trial. But sometimes we get into those trials our own stupid stupidity, right? I know I have. And James says here, listen. We're going we're gonna to get to the good approach here in just a minute, but I'm just trying to get you the context here. The context is really important. And so he's saying that when you fall into various trials, that's another word, various trials, and that means that Trials are different for each of us. Trial for me may not be the same thing for Aaron or for, or for Sam or for, or for any of you. So trials vary in type. They, try, they vary in duration. Some people have trials that last for minutes, hours, days, weeks, years. And they also vary in intensity. All that's in those few verses there few words so look what he says now with all that in mind he says it's when we fall into various trials and tests he says now let's go back my brethren count it all or look what he says choose joy think about that if you want a good life in spite of what happens First of all, you need to recognize that troubles are going to come and they're going to be of various natures and intensities and and ways you get it into them. But he says you have an option here. And your option is you can have the right approach which means you choose joy. Unfortunately, most of us, when we have trials in our life, we react, we respond, but usually it's with complaining or self-pity or anger, right? 
But James says, no. The right way, the good way to approach troubles in our life is to choose joy. I am of the opinion that joy, first of all, you probably know this. You all have been very well taught, I know. Joy and happiness are not the same thing, right? You know that. Happiness is circumstantial. It's what happens to you. You got something great for Christmas. You're happy until you break it. Or, you know, okay, so I'm a Harley guy. And yesterday, you know, wasn't much to do. So me and my buddy went to the Harley shop. We both just got new motorcycles in the past year. I wrecked one, but I got another one, all right? You know, and I love my bike. Uh, but, you know, then you see there's a new model coming out, and you're like, oh, man, right? I mean, you're happy because circumstances change, and so happiness fluctuates. But joy isn't the same. Joy is an attitude. It's a mindset. We choose how we respond. And James is saying here, look, folks, that if you want the kind of life that you, you should have as a Christian, then the first thing you need, to do, you need to do is have a good approach, and that is to choose joy. And let me give you a, a couple of verses to think about. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, about Jesus. You know what it says? Jesus, who for the joy set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus chose, he, that you, you all know when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, if he could have avoided the cross, he would have. But it says he went to the cross, and in spite of all that was involved in that, he chose because he knew it was best for us, and he went with joy. He was obedient to his Father with joy. Here's another, I don't know if, if you remember this, but in the Old Testament book of Habakkuk, you don't have to turn there, but listen to what Habakkuk says. Habakkuk talks about problems, and in Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 17, it says this. Though the fig tree may not blossom, that's not good if you're a, a fig tree owner, uh, or, no, or a fruit be on the vines, though the labor of the olive may fail, and the fields yield no fruit, food, though the flock may be cut from the field, and there be no uh, herd in the stalls. In other words... This is not a good year to be a farmer. That's what he's saying. Yet I will what? I will rejoice. I will joy in the God of my salvation. He's saying that in spite of what happens, I am going to choose to have joy in the Lord. Let me hear an amen on that one, folks. You can choose. The problem is most of us choose to be grumpy, to be bitter, to be angry. I know this is true of myself. I used to say, till the Lord convicted me, uh, so-and-so makes me so angry. Nobody makes me angry. I choose to react in anger. I choose my attitude. And, 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 and when I saw this, it was like, whoa, Fred, mind-blowing. <laughs> because when trouble comes my way, I can choose to pout and to wallow in self-pity, and I could choose to be bitter, and I could choose to be angry, or I can choose, you know what, God? I don't love this, but you're good. You are my life. You are my heart. I choose joy. And that applies to you as a church as you're in transition. You can choose joy it doesn't matter whether you know we get snow it doesn't matter whether the church is full or not full it doesn't matter if you have a pastor or not pastor it doesn't matter you know what matters god is on the throne he does never changes he's the same yesterday today and forever and when we focus on him we can choose to have joy in him i mean if you think about it, the Bible, this is, a, this is a recurring mantra through all of Scripture. Uh, here's a chapter I'm sure many of you know, John chapter 14. And what's the first word of John 14? Don't let your heart be troubled. You choose. I, I can't always choose what happens to me. I can't always choose the way things are going to go. 
I can't always choose if, if, if circumstantially my day is going to be good, bad, or awful. But I can choose how I respond to that. I can choose that. That's what James is saying here. It's a, the good approach is to make the right choice. Now, this choice is not mindless, but it's based on the right perspective. Look what he says. Count on all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing, we're going to come back to this, but knowing that the testing of your faith works patience, produces patience. You see, I'm choosing joy not just because, you know, just because I'm some sort of mindless, brainless fool, but I'm choosing joy based on the knowledge of the fact that God is on the throne and that God is in control. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting how much of life is based on our perspective, how we see things. Um, I mean, it's in, in a very, just in a very kind of basic way. Our home that we built, been, we built it about 10 years ago, and it's, it's very open, kind of like, you know, when you go to a beach house, it's just open. You walk in the front door, and you can see pretty much every, the whole first floor. And uh, I don't know about you, but I tend to be a creature of habit, but, but given the fact that I've only been here a couple times, I think everybody's pretty much where they were last time, all right? So I think we're all pretty much creatures of habit, right? But, you know, when I go and have coffee in the morning at the breakfast table, I pretty much sit in the same chair. And if I'm going to eat, I'm going to sit in the same chair. And you know when I really shake my life up is when I go and sit in another chair. <laughs> because guess what? The whole house looks different. Do you ever notice that? I challenge you, go home and sit in a different chair. Or sit in a different chair in here. Things look different. You see, it's about perspective. And what James is saying here is that we may not be able to control what happens in our life, but if we have the right perspective, we could choose joy. I, I, I state this to my, my colleagues at work all the time. Originality is forgetting where you steal something from. All right? Think about it. You'll get it anyway. And so uh, uh, here's one. I don't know where I first heard it, but now I'm going to claim it. It's, uh, you can you know, put quotes Fred Malacy on there. Uh, January 7th, 2024. You ever heard of a guy named Goliath? Anybody ever hear of Goliath, right? You know who Goliath was? Think about Goliath for a minute. To the Israelites, to Saul and his warriors, Goliath was too big to kill, right? But to David, he was too big to miss. Right? I mean, they were like, he's so big. Every day he came out and he and he 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 disparaged Saul and the Israelite army and mostly the God of Israel. Forty days and forty nights that went on, and they just shivered in their boots. Why? He's too big. David comes along, and he's like, he's so big, I only need five little stones. I'm going to whack him out with one stone. Same giant. The only difference was perspective. And that's true with the giants in your life. That's why when it comes to transition, you know, people like to come into churches, and they're so sad, and they're so discouraged. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is an amazing opportunity. God's ready to do something else. Something good. Remember last time? I, I, when, when I was here back in November, I, I gave you so-so's questions, my granddaughter's questions. I said, what's going to happen? Well, I don't know what's going to happen at Mount Carmel. But I can tell you this. If you trust God and you have the right perspective, perspective it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Now, how do we know? He's, Paul, or James says, knowing this, how do we know? Well, we know from a lot of reasons. Number one, we know from this book right here. We know that David did kill Goliath. We, do, we know that the Israelites did come out of bondage. We know that Jesus rose from the grave. 
We know that Jesus healed the sick and raised the dead. We know that the gospel spread. We know that there were people that went through all kinds of trials and tribulations, and even though some of them died, they kept their faith. We know that people had joy in spite of terrible circumstances from this book. We also know it from history. If you read good biographies, we know it even from our own experiences. Remember, I've been here three different times at Mount Carmel, all right? I know, it's going to be okay. And so when I say you have to have the, a good approach to have a good life, I'm not asking you to believe something out of mindless faith. I'm asking you just to accept the evidence that God has provided in his word and throughout history. And that's what James is telling us. One more example, and then I'll move on. Second Timothy or Second Corinthians 12, chapter 12. Paul's there. Paul was going through a tough time. Ask God for deliverance. You know the story. And God's answer to him was, yeah, no, Paul, sorry, no, not this time. My grace is sufficient. Paul, because he knew about, he's the one that wrote about, rejoice in the Lord always, Philippians chapter 4, and again in said rejoice. Since he knew all about where his joy should be, he was like, don't like it, but all good. All good, number two. So, not only, if we're going to have a good year and a good life, should we have a good approach, but secondly, we need to make a good ask. What do you mean by that? So, I think I said this last time I was here, but Jesus was a great teacher, and he asked a lot of great questions, and I like questions. I think questions are, are awesome. As a teacher, they engage people. Uh, when we go to Portugal, we're going to be doing some sessions, and we were kind of planning out the sessions that we're going to be uh, sharing, and questions are a big part of, you know, if you want people to interact with you, you've got to ask them questions. And that's what I mean by asks. Here, not so much just questions. But we need to make the good ask when we are in trials if we're going to have a good year, a good life. First of all, I want you, though, to notice what we don't ask for. What we don't ask for. Verse 5. We'll come back to verse 4 in a minute. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask from God, who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to you. Again, let's remember the context here. The context is James is writing to people who experience various trials. He tells them they need to ask for something. But did you notice what, it, what he didn't tell them to ask for? He didn't ask them, or excuse me, he didn't tell them to ask for deliverance. I don't know about you, but when I'm in trouble, the first thing I usually do is ask for help. Anybody else like that? Help. God, deliver me. God, heal me. God, provide for that need. God, take care of... Apostle. Now listen, I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. I just think it's interesting in this context. James doesn't tell them to ask for help. He doesn't tell them to ask for deliverance. He doesn't ask them for release. He doesn't, he doesn't ask... He tells them to... Excuse me. Let me I get, my brain gets going and my mouth doesn't catch up. Anyway, he doesn't tell them to ask for deliverance, release, or a way out. Those things are fine. But here's the thing. That may not be God's best for us at that moment. Now, that's not a very positive or popular thing to say. Because, again, and, and I'm the first to admit it, I like ease. I like deliverance. I like, I like a way of escape. But James is indicating, I think, here, that while... You know, God will always deliver us, maybe not the way we want, but, and God always has our best interests at heart, but that's not always the thing we need to ask for. So again, let's, let's get real personal to you as a church. Certainly, certainly, it's okay for you as a church to pray that God would send you a pastor, ASAP. There's nothing wrong with that. But is that the best thing to ask for? Hmm. 
Well, if I'm, if I'm just you know, basing it off of this text, not so sure. I'm not so sure. You know, God will provide a pastor. But what does he say here? The thing that we should ask for isn't necessarily release or our way out. But he says, verse 5, if any of you la lacks wisdom, ask for that. So think about this for a minute. A good life, a key to a good life, first step is a good approach, which means we understand that problems are part of life, trials are part of life, and that we need to choose joy based on all that we know experientially and from Scripture. And while we're in the midst of that mess, it's okay to ask God to deliver us and, to, and for a way out, but the first thing we should be asking for is wisdom. And ask yourself, how often when you're in trouble do you ask God for wisdom? Not too often. Too busy worrying about getting out. And yet that's exactly what James says here. Ask for wisdom. I mean, the quintessential example of this is Solomon, 1 Kings chapter 3, right? Solomon knew he was in over his head. He became king. David, everybody loved David. David was a great king. Solomon had to fill in his dad's shoes. Solomon knew he was, he was very much underqualified for the task ahead of him. And God said to him, you can ask for anything. And what did he ask for? He asked for wisdom. Before you stands a father of six and a grandfather of 18. But it may surprise you, but when we first found out we were going to have our oldest daughter, who's now 44 and a half, I really wasn't cut out to be a parent. <laughs> I mean, seriously, can you imagine me at 22? Seriously, I mean, who would give that guy a kid, right? I knew that. And so pretty much from the time... I found out my wife was pregnant till this day. Almost every day, I've had one prayer. Lord, you say you're going to give me wisdom. Please give me wisdom. Believe it or not, it, you don't have to believe it. God knows it's true or not. I ask God for wisdom as to what I'm going to preach when I come up here. I mean, seriously. There's like 4,000 sermons in this head. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I could show you on my, uh, my, my, my uh, FileMaker program. So I could keep you here. Well, I'm not going to keep you here at 430 because Eagles play at 430. But other than that, I could keep you a long time. So the question for me isn't, isn't you know, I mean, I have stacks of sermons. But I'm not going to just go like this. You know what? I don't know what you need. God knows what you need, so i got to say, Lord, you need to give me wisdom to know what to preach at Mount Carmel on January 7, 2024. And you may disagree. You'll have to take it up with him, but I feel like he does that. I feel like he, on the way up, I changed some stuff. Because I just felt like God was just enlightening me. And it wasn't like I saw a sign, which for me that would be dangerous because then I would run off the road. But it was just like God spoke to me and he said, Fred, this is where I want you to go today. You know why? Because I asked him for wisdom. And guess what? You as a church need wisdom. You need it big time. You can, you, you know, it's good to do research. I'm all for research and it's good to, good to, to, get, to get counsel but what you need to do as a church is get on your face individually and collectively and say, Lord, yeah, we want a pastor, but what we really want is wisdom to get the right one. And you know what? I love this. If you lack wisdom, which... Ask God, look at the next phrase, and he gives to you. He will give it to you, but he says, who gives to all liberally 
without approach. Now, I know up in Luray, Pennsylvania, or Virginia, being liberal is not all that popular, all right? When we're talking about this kind of liberality, this is a good thing. He is a good, good father. He gives, and he gives. He gives. But he doesn't just give us stuff. He gives us what we need. And he will give us wisdom. He'll give you wisdom. Because he is that kind of God. James says in verse 6, but let him ask in faith, no doubt. Don't doubt it. God doesn't play a mysterious shell game. I go to Liberty basketball games and, and Liberty football games with my, one of my friends, and, and they always have on the scoreboard this thing is like, guess where Sparky is? Sparky is the Liberty thing dumb thing anyway uh and then they you know and uh, so you know you have sparky and then he's moving around and moving around i get lost i just can't follow it but you're supposed to guess is is sparky under football or basketball one two or three i think some of us think god operates that way all right here's my will Shh, where is it here's my good stuff where is it you're gonna have to work for it. no god doesn't work that way god wants to give you wisdom you just got to ask for it. He's a good father. He's a good God. He says, ask in faith. You know what faith is, don't you? Here's another. You can write this down from Fred Malacy, who stole it from who knows who, all right? Sam, you can use it when you go, and you don't have to give me credit, but if I hear about it, I'm suing you. Anyway. <laughs> faith. Faith is anticipation minus anxiety. Anticipation minus the anxiety. Anticipate. So, we have faith that you're going to get a pastor. That's anticipation. Faith is the idea is we're not going to worry about it. We're not going to worry about how long. We're going we're gonna to let God take care of that. We anticipate, and we're not going to get anxious about it. Number three. So, you want a good year? You've got you to take, right, uh, take a good approach. You've got to make the right ask. Finally, you need to seek, a, excuse me, good outcome or aftermath. So, I loved listening to Lon Solomon when he was at McLean. I still listen to him, and I love that he always would have his so what question. And, and as I read through this passage, I'm like, okay, so what? Okay, so why? Why, besides obedience, why in the world should I take this approach? Why should I expect that this is the way for a good 2024 or a good life? I mean, that's a legitimate question. Well, one reason we, we know we can expect a good outcome or a good aftermath is because of what we already know. Verse 3, which I already talked about. But look what it says in verse 3. It says, but, uh, but let patience or endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. You see what James is saying here? He's saying here with this approach, it produces results tangible results in us it makes us become what God intends us to be we all know that when he uses the word perfect here when he says that uh, uh, let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect we all know no one's perfect I know I'm not perfect I know none of you are perfect I think Aaron thinks he's perfect, but he's not, all right? And, but we're not perfect. The word means, you know this, it means mature, complete. And so what James is reminding us of is that if we take this approach, 
we follow this good approach and make this good ask, then one of the things that we'll, we'll, we'll find out is it'll, re, it'll produce this good outcome or this good aftermath, which is we will become more like what God wants us to be. We will be better versions of who, than who we are now. More like Christ. And that's the goal. The goal is completion. And we will, he says... We lack nothing, verse 4. That you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Isn't that amazing? Lacking nothing. Having you what you need. We talk about Christ being our sufficiency. I don't think most people really think about what that means. But here he's saying that when we take this approach and make this ask, it produces this good outcome, which is we lack nothing. And we have no doubts or stability. Now again, did you notice? This is all a choice. All of this is, all of this is in, the, uh, in the command mode, but he's telling us we have a choice. But you let patience have its perfect work. You ask. You count. God doesn't twist our arms and make us do this. This is our choice. But to not do it means we're going to have a life that is not as good as it could be. I don't know about you. That's not what I want out of my life. You know, it says in John chapter 14, and then I'm done. Let me make sure I read it correctly. John chapter 14, in verse 13, Jesus says this. Whatever you ask, ask in my name, that I will do. Why? That the Father may be glorified. See, that's really the ultimate good here. It's not just that I have a good life or a good year. It's that in me seeking after that goal, God is glorified. People see God's work in me. Hopefully encourages them, challenges them, motivates them to live in the same way. So, you want a good year? I do. You want a good life? I sure do. Been good so far. I want to end good. No, that's not the right English, but Gordon's not here, right? I'm good. Okay. Good. I want a good life. I want to end that way. Guess what? It's up to us to decide. We can make it happen. No matter what, no matter what happens to us, we can make it happen. How? By taking a good approach. Choosing joy. By making a good ask. Asking for wisdom. Thirdly, by seeking a good outcome. Forty, completion. Praise to God.